My name is Steve Westgarth, and this is The Engineering Leader. Today on The Engineering Leader, I'm joined by Chris Barker, a principal software engineer working at Jaguar Land Rover. Chris is also a published author, having released books focused on iOS with Swift and Swift UI. Chris, it's great to have you on The Engineering Leader today. Thank you very much for having me, Stephen. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, so why don't we jump straight in and uh, get started by talking about your engineering journey. Um, you're now an iOS developer. Um, I remember when we yep. first met many years ago, you used to develop for .NET. What made you switch? So, I mean, I, you know, don't get me wrong. I loved, I loved .NET applications. I love, you know, I, I, worked, for, uh, I worked for a company called dabs.com building applications. We did in-house in uh, desktop applications, internet applications. We also maintained the website as well. Uh, and I really enjoyed web development and, and, and .NET application development. But I think what happened for me is when is when the iPhone first came out. And I remember the guy who used to sit next to me came in to the office one day and he sat down and he said, I've done it, I've been and bought one. And he was showing me that this this device and, and I was kind of in awe of this, of the power that would come out of a device that would sit in your pocket. And I was like, you know, that is that is it's groundbreaking, which you know we all know it, and it is, and it's the same with all smartphones at the time, you know. But there was just something really special about that. And as a developer, I was like, you know, what would it be like to to build apps for that? And then, kind of lo and behold, obviously, I think it was it iOS two came out when they released the, the first SDK for the developers. You know, it was like, oh, so you can actually you can actually build apps, you know, using Apple's native APIs to to kind of you know to to, to run on this device and, this, and you looked at some of the quality of the apps that, that that you could get compared to what you was building for a website where you know you you know websites were great and, and still are but you you're limited to you're limited to the capability of the browser which you know you're always chasing and that's something i'll come to later on uh, uh tonight but you know you're limited to the, the browser and then obviously the machine that it runs on as well you know plays some part in that but you you you're not limited with a device, you know, and, and and the hardware that kind of you know, the hardware that allows you to to kind of really really push the boundaries. Uh, and as a developer, it was it was just it was it was just a case of I want a piece of that, you know, I want to be able to turn around and build something for that device. So that's kind of where the journey started, and that's kind of how how I got the ball rolling. Really, you know, it kind of it kind of like I was like, oh right, okay, what can I do? But the problem I had at the time was is I didn't own a Mac. You know, there was no cross-platform development as such then. So it's like, okay, so it's like, well, I could look at doing some Android. So I did, I did you know, I had a little double Android, got myself a cheap Android tablet, but I just kept being drawn back to this, this, you know, this amazing piece of hardware that Apple had released. So I really, really want to build an app for that. So I kind of, you know, my spare time, I kind of tested the water. I was looking around for, you know, like you do, you know, young developer, a little bit naive, okay, build iPhone apps on a Windows machine. You Google, you know, you go, you Google it till the cows come on. It's like, yeah, you need a Mac, you need a Mac. And there was this one team of people who'd built an SDK, and it was called, I think it was called the Dragonfire SDK. What it allowed you to do was, was build an iOS app in Visual Studio on your Windows machine, and it wouldn't compile it as such. What it would do is it would just zip all the files that once you'd done. You would then upload it to their portal. They would compile it for you and then give you the IPA back. And that was it. That was like, okay, I'm going to build an app for the app store on my Windows machine. And you were very limited to what you could do. There was no, you know, obviously back in them days, it was it was Interface Builder as a separate entity. And there was none of that, you know, everything you had to do programmatically, which was fine. You know, I, I didn't care, I, I was building an app. And I started to do that. I started to, you know, to, to have a go at it. And, and lo and behold, I actually, I built a small game. And I was like, okay, this is really, really cool. I really like this. Managed to get it published onto the Apple app. So they did that for you. You would send them these C++ files they were upload them to the portal, you would pay them $10 and they would submit it to Apple on, on your behalf for you through the developer portal. It was crazy, but it was it, it worked. And, you know, for someone at the time, you know, I didn't have a Mac and I couldn't really afford one at the time either. It was uh, it, it was my way in, in the, in, into the App Store. And I kind of released it and it was great. Yeah, I'm an app developer now, this is fantastic. You know, and, and I kind of sat there and I was like, you know, I was still doing the .NET development. I was like, this is really, really cool, but I felt like a little bit of a fraud because I'd done it through this Dragonfire SDK. I wouldn't hadn't written it natively. 
And that's when I kind of said, right, okay, I need to, I need to make that jump now. I need to kind of, you know, I, I need to buy the bullet. I need to get a mic and I need to see, do I have the capability to do that? And kind of that's where the journey went from there. And that was the kind of the start of the journey. And, that, and I kind of never really looked back from that. And I guess, you know, back in the day, you know, writing that first app, you know, for, uh, to, to actually release into the Apple App Store, it was a massive thing. I remember when I published my first app on the App Store, you get that, that really big buzz out of it. But if you kind of fast oh, yeah, yeah. how the whole, the whole ecosystem's evolved over the last, you know, what, 15 years or so, do you think it's still as important to develop native apps? Or are we at a point where your progressive web apps are kind of moving into a world where actually you can do most of the things you would want to do in a native app in a progressive web app? So why do you need to build native? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is a question that gets, I think, gets battered around a lot of the time. I mean, you know, progressive web apps for me, uh, a lot of it comes down to the market. And, and there's two sides of it. There's the market and there's also, you know, the team, the people who's building it. You know, it's great to know that you there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of options out there for di you know, different developers with different skill sets to be able to build an app or build an app like uh, uh, mechanism, you know, to, to, to release you know, to release their product out into the wild. Uh, but for me, you know, I, when, you look, when you look at the figures or, you know, people have told me in the past, you know, mobile web users, you know, if we talk, talk about progressive web apps, you know, mobile web users, people who browse say, eBay or Amazon using, the, you know, Safari or Chrome on the phone, you know, going to 3w.amazon.com, for example, you know, uh, they're a different set of customers that use apps. You know, you find out they probably don't have many apps on the smartphone. They don't tend to use it because they've got the web mindset. So it, it's, it's it's reaching out to, it's, you know, why would you would you build a progressive web app and not a, a, native, a native app? You know, then actually probably you would do both because you're reaching out to a wider audience. But then comes the additional question of, well, then when you build the native app, do you build it native iOS and Android or do you go cross-platform with it? I kind of guess that's where, and that, that comes a second question, really. And what's your view of that question? <sighs> Again, so this is where it kind of splits off the skill set. And, and you know, it, for me, it depends on what you're building. You know, I mean, I, I love the cross-platform development world. It intrigues me. You know, I, I've, I've always said for a long, long time, it, it, I feel it has a place in the industry. Without a doubt, you know, you give an example of, you know, if you're a Microsoft house, software house, you know, and you've got all Microsoft devs and, you know, you want to get an app out to a small subset of customers, not too bothered about using all the latest Apple APIs or it just needs to do X, Y and Z. It could be an app for some you know, people out in, in, in the field or HR app or anything like that. You know, then you would you would choose to, you know, in my eyes, you would choose to build it in Xamarin, you know, because you've got the opportunity, you've got the, the skill set of the devs with the programming language knowledge in-house you know there's probably just a little bit of training to do maybe bring one dev in from the outside who's had some mobile experience before to just you know to kind of wrap it around a little bit and get the submissions through and understand the mobile app ecosystem a little bit but you, you know that's where cross-platform and the same for react as well you know react developers if you've got a react house you know maybe you would build it you would look to potentially build it internally so you could you could show the features and you know you, you could build it together but if you know if if you if you want to build an app which is groundbreaking, you know, up to date with the latest Apple technologies or the latest Google technologies, you know, always at the forefront, then you, you've got to go native, you know. You, and you know, in terms of you know availability for developers, it, it's it's you know, if you if you're building a React Native app and you want to build, you know, you're going to have to bring React Native developers in. You know, uh, if you're the Microsoft house, yeah, you're going to you probably be able to, you know, unless you can set aside 12 months, you know, for one team not to do any work other than work on the app, you're going to have to probably bring people in. So, you know, there's no difference in, in bringing in a native app developer in to do it if you want to push go down the native route, in my opinion. I think um, I think recently I've been very impressed by Scotland Motor Platform as an idea. And I think that the reason I like that um, is that you can continue with a native framework. You can continue using Swift UI. You can continue um, you're building out your, your Android app with your Android devs, but you can abstract that business logic away um, into a different layer. And it, it kind of almost kind of feels as if it's trying to use the best of both worlds. Because one of the problems that I've always found with cross-platform frameworks is that the user experience doesn't match what your a, a native app can really kind of deliver especially when you're looking at still what switch ui will do you have to say for example 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that's another reason that I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, it, it, again, it depends what your app is and what you're looking to achieve with it. If it's, if it's a throwaway app, if it's a marketing app, that's going to have a, a shelf life of six to 12 months. You know, uh, you know, you want to get something out quick, you know, you'd say you're a, you're a software house or a software agency, you know, then yeah, let's do, do it cross platform because you can write it once, throw it away. You know, uh, you're maintaining one code base and you, you know, it's taking up less developers resource. Like I said, if you want to do something special and, you know, and, you know, user experience is at the forefront. Well, I mean, yes, user experience should be at the forefront of everything you build, of course, but, you know, there comes a point when, you know, you're pushing for a five star, you know, you want to have a five star app in the app store. You want to give good customer experience if you're a retailer or anything like that. It's different from someone inputting data, you know, who's going knocking on doors, you know, taking, taking information off people at the front doors you know it's, it's different you know uh so you're not too worried about whether the animation's perfect or whether it jumps a couple of times when you move from one text field to another you know uh so again that's that's for me is 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 is, is the kind of the moment where you, you say to yourself okay you know what what do, what do we want to build here and who are we building it for so so much of this depends on the individual context that you're you're working within. Yeah, um, you know there is there is definitely times when cross platform has a place, um, and there is definitely times when you want to, to to build natively. And I think so much of it comes down to what you as a company are trying to achieve. I mean, if you're trying to launch a, a platform business, for example, if you're trying to um, you know uh, become the next your data driven platform with multiple propositions, you're kind of a Deliveroo or an Uber Eats, say. Um, you know, an, uh, an Airbnb or something like that. Um, you know, do you really want to kind of you'll know, be investing in in, in cross platform technology to do that when you aren't going to you know, really deliver the best user experience you possibly can? Especially when you're in a world where you're, you're probably competing against others that might be doing similar things in your space, and you're really trying to differentiate. You differentiate by putting a really high quality product out into the market that allows the market to you know, to really kind of you're going to feel for. For your app to build an affinity with it and get a really high quality user experience. If, on the other hand, you're you're trying to create a utility app that's maybe to be used by your employees, back office, you know, it doesn't really matter if the user experience is actually spot on every yeah. time. Uh, you know, maybe there's a very small user base you want to try something really quickly and see kind of you know what it works. Maybe there's a case, but actually, if you've got your engineers that are available to you um, that have iOS skills or Android skills. Why would you go out and try and find a you know a, a, a team that has cross platform skills? It just doesn't it just doesn't make any sense. You've got to look at exactly. your context, and what your engineering context is, and and kind of see how that works for you, and then put something out into the into the market which makes sense from an engineering point of view. Yeah, no, I mean you know, and I think another thing you mentioned there as well it, it's yeah. Cross-platform development could be good for you know for rapid prototyping. You know you want to try something, you want to test the waters and get it out the door. But you know that was okay three years ago. But now with Swift UI coming in, you know, and I think this for me this has been one of the big pushes for Swift UI. The ability to to build something quickly uh, is 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 one of the is a is a massive win. You know, and why would we you know why would you even consider cross-platform when you can knock something up in Swift UI in, in, in a quarter of the time, you know, at a prototype level, you know, something that you could just put in the hands of users within the space of a week, you know, uh, again, it's, it's, yeah, you know, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it will, and I'm, you know, I'm sure cross-platform will still have its space, you know, its place, sorry, in, uh, in the industry for a while to come, because, you know, there's, there's people who bought into it, there's companies who are using it day in, day out, you know, but it's just again, it just comes down to like you said, it just comes down to what you actually want, you know, as a, as a company. So you you've mentioned Swift UI there, and I mean, I, I am talking to someone who has literally written a book on Swift UI, <laughs> so I'm very aware that I'm kind of bowing down to expertise that I couldn't I couldn't claim to have. Um, Swift UI is obviously the new um, the new Apple framework that was released what two years ago now. Um, you know, three, was, I think, yeah. Three, three years ago, um, for, for user interface design. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I hadn't really looked at Swift UI. I'd heard a lot about it. Um, you know, I've, I've been developing iOS apps for you know what, you know, thirteen, fourteen years. Um, and you know, I, I guess I was working for a company. I didn't really have a need to kind of be in day to day kind of you know iOS app development. My skills have maybe lapsed a little bit. Um, and actually, over the last probably you know three or four months. 
um, I've, I've been back in a world where we're doing some mobile development again. So, so I've been exploring Swift UI. Um, and I've, uh, I've, I've been kind of finding out more about it. And what an amazing framework. Um, it's, uh, it's absolutely phenomenal. I mean, but I mean, you obviously agree with that. I mean, you've literally written a book. Well, I'll say this. I'll say, I, I'm going to say, you say it's an absolute amazing framework. I will say, no, I believe so. And the reason, no, that may come as a bit of a shock considering I've written a book. So I wrote the book when it was still in beta. I got approached by the publisher to write the book when it was still in beta. So I did a lot of the writing, but I was learning it as I was going along. Uh, and the beta was, I don't, I don't like using the word unstable because I think it's unfair, but it was, it was, it was a beta and it was the first version of the beta. And it, it bit me a little bit because I could see so much potential for the framework and I was so excited by it. But by the end of writing the book, I was kind of like, this isn't production ready yet. You know, it's going to be a while before we do this. And I was kind of like, yeah, I'll shelve that for a little while now. And maybe I'll let it, I'll let it, you know, I'll let it catch up before I really pick it up again. And, and you know, like many people will be, you know, I mean, there's no way when I, uh, my current job at the, at the time, there was no way we could look to adopt Swift UI. I mean, we did eventually find little ways to do it of like proof of concepts, but, you know, there was no way we'd look to, to stop and rewrite our app, you know, and I, I think, you know, I think, any company you went to within 12 months of Swift UI being released, we're never going to go down that go down that route straight away. I mean, yeah, I'm sure that many people were looking into it and starting to kind of tinker with it a little bit and see what options they are. But I kind of I kind of just wanted to. My mind was like, okay, I need to I need to let this grow a little bit. And lo and behold, it did grow, and it grew a lot faster than I thought it would do. And I've actually found myself lagging behind a little bit in it now. And I really do I'm, I do need to play a little bit of catch up with it. But you know, I, from the noise that I see on 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 in the iOS dev community and social media and everything like that, it really does appear to be a solid solid framework. You know, uh, it's the bit like and one of the things I touched on before was the ability to to rapid prototype. I think with Swift UI is 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 is, is one of the big wins for me. You know, you look at, I mean, not, knocking together, oh, I don't know a list which has got a load of data in there you know you compare that to building a new ui kit which is i'm sure you know any decent ui kit dev can do it with their eyes shut you know if you do it programmatically you set your delegates etc cetera, etc cetera, you bring your data sources in blah 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 but then you look at the equivalent in swift ui and it's like three lines of code you know so if it's taking you that amount of time to do that you can then concentrate on on doing everything else if you, you know if you want to do if you want to knock up say you know a new pop-up filter menu for for a retailer or something like that you know, but you, you don't want to commit to it. I mean, I know there's design tools out there that, you know, people, uh, designers can go ahead and do it. But if you wanted to actually physically put it in the hands of someone in an app, you know, behind a feature toggle or behind an experimental uh, developer page or whatever, you could really knock that up in Swift UI so quickly. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It can be rough and ready. Uh, and you can just, you can put it in the hands of your stakeholders straight away. And so there you go, have a quick play with that. We've just knocked that up, you know, and it's not taking any developer's time to do it. They've not had to tweak little things, they've not had to take a sprint away to go and do it and to knock this prototype up in UI kit. You know, someone's probably just knocked it up in half a day or something like that. And you turn around and play with it and then you can make a decision there and then, right, do I keep it or do I throw it away? If you do one or two things, you can keep it and you can build it in your UI kit app. You can sit and build it in your existing UI kit app, do it, you know, that matches your current code base, or you can build it out in Swift UI should you be able to support the API of whatever it is you've built, you know, and uh, you can just, you can build it out and it, it's, it's so powerful, so powerful. And you've touched on a, a number of things there that I'd like to explore. I mean, you know, probably the, the most pressing thing is, you know, how, how quickly should we be adopting framework? So, you know, we're what, six, seven weeks away from WWDC now. Uh, yes. Apple will come out with a whole raft of new frameworks, new techniques, new ways of doing things. Um, and as engineers, we'll all get the new and shiny kind of feel. We'll all go and try new things out and kind of see what we can do um, and become really excited by some of these things. But actually, just because it's been released by Apple doesn't necessarily mean that it's production ready or that actually yeah. it's good to go into your app. So, you know, from, from your experience, how long do we need to wait? And, you know, when, when is it safe to start adopting your new technologies that have just been released? And it was a good question. I mean, you know, I, I got asked this a lot, especially when I was writing the book for the Swift UI as well. You know, it was, you know, when is it ready? Is it production ready? And I kind of put this in the book. I kind of said it's the way I worded it is it's still in its infancy. So just be careful. You know, 
it, and for me, it's production ready when you think it's production ready. You know, does it do stable? Is it stable for what, you know, if you build something in Swift AI, is it stable enough for you to release to production? You know, forget about the features, that, you know, forget about all the extra features it does or it doesn't do. You know, if it doesn't do half the stuff you want it to do, then you shouldn't be building in Swift UI, you know. Uh, if you can build something, whether it's just one page that harnesses some information and it looks good, it's stable, you know, and you're not have to do any any hacks or anything with it, or you're not, have to change, you know, refactor a lot of code in order to get it in in a certain way. If that works, then it's stable for you, you know. Turning around and saying, okay, should I build a brand new app from scratch? Again, it depends on what you're building. You know, I did I did a radio app for my local uh, local uh, community radio station, and I decided to do it in Swift UI. And I think I targeted iOS 13. It was just after. Uh, it was about halfway through uh, uh, when the full release came out, and I did it just as a you know, just again, uh, you know, I thought it was you know, I better build something in Swift UI just to say I've done it. Really, uh, I did it in Swift UI, and there were a couple of points when I almost had to stop and say I can't remember exactly what they were. Stop and say. Am I going to be able to do this? Am I going to be able to finish it? Is it going to give me exactly what I want? And eventually it did. It gave me everything I needed it to do. And it was all in Swift UI and I didn't have to cut any corners. You know, and I was happy. And so for me, that was production ready. Now, if I wanted to go any further with that, and I don't know, really build out the app to do, I don't know, something, I can't think of anything, but anything, you know, something fantastic and fancy or anything like that, maybe it wouldn't have been. And maybe I would have hit a bit of a brick wall. Now, again, all depends what you're building and who you're building for. So if you're building a brand new app, do you do as much as you can in Swift UI, then do the remainder in UI kit and then build out as and when it becomes stable? I kind of guess that's up to you. You could do, you know, therefore you're future proofing your app and you're not having to go back and rewrite it in Swift UI. If you're looking at an existing code base, you know, then obviously, you know, you've got one or two options. You may not have the ability to rewrite an entire business app company app in Swift UI, so you might want to start adopting features. Uh, again, it's just, it's pinpointing, for me, it's pinpointing those areas where you can write something in Swift UI. I mean, obviously, you've got to think about about the compatibility of that. What, what does, you, what, you know, what OS, how far back does your does, uh, version of iOS, does your, does your app support, you know? I mean, if, if you can go back as far as iOS 13, that's fine, as long as you're happy to use some of the earlier Swift UI features. And uh, my previous my previous company, M. Brown, we, we did that. We, we took a look at the core base and said, okay, like, uh, we, we moved up to uh, iOS 13 minimum. Uh, oh, no, sorry, we moved up to iOS 11 minimum, and we wanted to put some Swift UI in there. Uh, but so it's like, okay, we're going to have to, we can't build a, a brand new feature in there because we're going to have to write it twice, you know, and we can't turn around and build a feature that's just for Swift UI users or iOS, iOS 13 users and above. We can't do that because we just, you know, even though the stats were pushing more towards iOS 13 users with the more predominant users of the app, you still can't, you still can't do that. Uh, so we're like, okay, let's identify an area of code that we could potentially write in iOS 13 that already has an existing feature in there that we can toggle should the user be on iOS 13 and above. So we looked and we found one little area, but the key point for me there was, was okay, we could do that with all areas. We could do that with a lot of areas. But you're maintaining two two parts of the code then, you know. And what I don't want to have to do is, is turn around and say, okay, product detail page. Someone, you know, we're going to make a change to it. We've got to make the change in Swift UI and we're going to make the change in UI kit. That is just never going to happen. So we managed to find a, a page which was, I think, was kind of harnessing a web view almost and just yeah, give it a little, did a few little cute things with it and give it a title. And I thought, okay, well, that page, isn't, that's never, ever going to change in UI kit. It's always going to be like that. We're never going to get a request to change that. So that was a good testing ground for us. And we built a native Swift UI page for that and injected the data into it, into Swift UI. And that was our first test point. And that was stable for us. Uh, there was never going to be, you know, dual maintenance on, on both versions of the, uh, the, the UI frameworks. And it was, our, it was our stepping stone to put in Swift UI in the app as a proof of concept. And it was great as well for the devs as well, because they got to have a play with Swift UI because, you know, it, it would probably be at least another couple of years before we got to the point where, you know, iOS 13 was going to be the minimum for uh, for the app. Uh, and at that point, it was like, even then, it, that would still only be the, the first first release of Swift UI. Uh, and it's like, I appreciate that, you know, Swift UI is moving on and not everyone can do it. But I, as, you know, as a tech lead at the time, I wanted to make sure my devs were being exposed to all the latest technologies. 
you know, they they were they were pushing themselves and iOS developers. And I think Swift UI was was you know was a big thing. I mean, you know, I, I could give them twenty percent days or innovation days where they go off and build a little Swift UI project, you know, just to learn about something. But you know, they're great for the moment building little things like that. But then they just sit on your hard drive as you know my project number one or my project number two, you know, and they, they just and they go stale and disappear and you forget what you've done with them. So actually being able to have to be able to have the ability to put something in the app, in the code base, see it working every day, and then actively maintain it. Because obviously, you know, if new versions of Swift UI come out, they may have to make tweaks to that, you know, so they would then get, get the opportunity then to, to play with it and to, you know, to update it and maintain it. But beauty about identifying this particular error is they didn't have to worry about the UI kit element, you know, and, uh, you know, it could just be that's how it goes on for the next couple of years. But, you know, it's just, it's, it is the way it is, unfortunately. I think there's so, there's so much truth in, in what you're saying there. I mean, if, you, if you're going to try a new feature or try a new framework, you've got to try it for real, right? I mean, you, if, if you're in a learning environment, you know, it's never going to be quite the same. You're never going to come across the same issues that you use as experience. Um, in, yeah. in production, and, and as as iOS engineers, I mean we, we are spoiled because you know typically yeah. users do keep up to date with with iOS versions. You know there's, there's a very high adoption rate. Now, I mean you're right. I mean you're talking there. We've still got to you know um, probably support back to iOS 13. Kind of feels reasonable. You know if, if you're talking about Android, you know and you kind of look at the the amount of versions they've got to continue to support. It becomes really difficult to make sure that you you're building the latest tech. Into an Android in, into an Android device, um, you know, because users don't always keep up to date, and there's a lot of um, a lot of older systems, a lot of older operating systems, um, you're still in circulation that, that the users haven't updated, and that's that that's, that's definitely a big challenge. Um, but for full disclosure, I mean, so I, I joined GSK earlier this year, and we started um, building out a, a new app, um, totally greenfield, uh, and we took the decision to to go all in on Swift UI. Um, in, into Brilliant. build that way. Our logic for that was that you know, okay, yeah, we we still need to you know uh, support you know some of those older features potentially at the point that we go live with our MVP. But actually, Swift UI is is only going to get stronger. Um, and you know, within twelve months, we're likely to be saying that you know we're no longer supporting iOS thirteen. Um, you know, we're pushing towards iOS fourteen, iOS fifteen. Um, yeah. And, and it's, it's it's no longer really an issue. So. You know, I think you know, for, for me, um, you know, given the, the best user experience we possibly can use my latest frameworks in our context is the most important thing for us to do right now. Um, but it doesn't always work. It, it does depend on the context you're working in. And I think the app you were just referring to there, you know, was was already you know, well established and had a you know a, a significant user base. And and you've got to really think about well, yeah, what exactly. you're for your users that are using your app at this particular point in time. And how how is that going to impact their lives? You know, what what difference is it going to make? Are we going to achieve the objectives that we want to achieve as a company if we make this technical decision? Exactly. I mean, you know, we're we're coming up to iOS sixteen release soon, and you know, there's probably a few people listening to this thinking, "What? You don't support iOS thirteen as a minimum?" And it's like, well, yeah, you know, in a greenfield project, or you know, in you know, and many other apps, I'm sure people have out there. Then, yeah, you know what? Actually, you know, the rule would always be. Maybe so, among some rule is, is one or two versions back, you know, minimum. Uh, but again, it depends on who you cut, like you said, it depends on who your customers are, you know. I mean, so I can't go into too much details, but looking at the percentages, there were a lot of customers using a lot of older versions of iOS, and you know, that that is that is revenue at the end of the day, you know, you and you know, you have to protect the revenue. So, you as, as frustrating as it is, you can't always just say, I'm dropping this because it's you know, it. As much as you'd love to as a developer, you know, your hands are tied sometimes. And, you know, there becomes a balance, you know, and, you know, there was times when we turned around and said, okay, you know, we've, you know, we had a lot of issues with iOS 10. As we know, it was in terms of layouts and stuff like that. It was, it was an awful release, iOS 10. And, you know, we started to have more problems supporting iOS 10 uh, than we did, you know, than we did in terms of, of, of customers using it and that was we were able to push that forward to the business and say okay we need to make a decision here uh, and you know it's costing us more to fix these issues than it is actually and we're getting off that and we found out the potential users had just not updated their os as well they could run an ios 11 so that allowed us to bump up but you know i mean that was only that was that was that was only a small percentage of people you know obviously you start to go up ios 11 ios 12 
the numbers got the number of active users got bigger, you know, and and you know, we, we like I said, we had to protect the revenue, so we still had to support all the versions, so we we couldn't cut off even up to iOS thirteen at the time. In, in thinking about you know, as, as a leader in technology, you know, how how do you drive and make those decisions? Because you know, quite often you'll find that you know maybe you're you're running an, an iOS team or maybe multiple iOS teams that are um, you're building our technical products and. You know, um, but there are some decisions that absolutely firmly need to remain in the control of the team, and the team need to, um, you know, to own those decisions to make those decisions and have every right to make those decisions. But you also have to balance that as a as, as a technical leader, as an engineering manager, or as yeah. somebody responsible for the product, with what the business's goals is and what 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 our business is trying to achieve. Um, how how have you found um, your how do you manage the stakeholder expectations in, in, in that space? How do you explain the problem? And also drive towards a solution. Yeah, I mean, it's there's always a lot of back and forth and stuff like this, you know. And I think, I think the best way to, the best way to deal with a situation like this is is to is to try and build a mutual respect between yourself and and the stakeholders. You know, obviously, you know, if if you show the respect to what they're trying to do and what they're trying to achieve, you know, in turn, you know, if you're working for a good company, they will give you the same respect back in terms of you know what you're talking about. In, you know, don't try and pull wool over their eyes. Don't turn around and tell them this is this is going to make us millions if we go down this route. You know, give it to them straight. And they may not understand that, but they will be able to tell that you you know what you're talking about. They'll be able to see believe. You know, you're, at the end of the day, they want you to build this product that they're dreaming of. You know, so so you're you're the expert in their eyes. So you know, you've got to. You've just got to be absolutely honest with them. Back as much up as you can with data. I mean, that last example was was, was a good one, uh, you know. And it was it was we got to the point now. We I think we released and uh, uh, we put a fix in for an iOS 10 layout issue, which was just I mean it was a few crashes, but it was just you know let's get the crash reports down a little bit, you know. And, and one of the devs said, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna finally hit the nail on the head with that. And it ended up having an adverse effect on an older version, uh, 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 an earlier version of iOS, which was used by a lot more customers. And it went into the app store and it was causing some crashes and some user bad user feedback. And we were like, like, and at that point, I just kind of put my foot down and I just said, Luke, I said, I said, we tried to fix this problem because we're supporting this older version. I said, this is, this is, you know, the effect it's hard. You know, I said, I said this is going to carry on going and going and going. We need to make this decision. And, you know, went with them with, with honesty and the data. And at that point, they just turned around and they went, yep, yeah, okay, we get it. You know, we totally get it. And vice versa, you know, the other way, they come to us and they say, look, you know, we, we, we need we need to support this. This is the reason why. These are the figures. This is the vision, you know. And rather than, if, you know, if they come to you and they kind of say, you need to make this work. It's how can we make this work? You know, you change your mindset straight away. Then you're like, okay, you, you understand there's a limitation from our side. You understand it's difficult for us, but you're looking to us to see if we can come up with an answer for you. And that then... I will give the respect back and turn around and say to them, okay, you know what, let's have a look, dig a little bit deeper. And you ever come up with the same conclusion, I will just say, look, you know, this we're still in the same situation here and and something's got to give. And, and some, you know, most of the time it comes down to numbers, you know, but I mean, just, just open and honest, you know, and again, you know, I don't expect them to pull wool over our eyes and, and vice versa. You know, it's just having open, honest lines of communication, conversation, you know, and, you know, I mean, I could have turned around and said, Okay, yeah, this iOS 10 issue actually is causing an issue on iOS 11 as well. We need to jump to 12. Actually, iOS 12 is causing us a problem, so can we go straight to 13? And if I'd have just given them some data and said, "Yeah, look, this, we're going to have these same problems all along. We need to jump three versions," you know, they could have turned around and gone, "All right, okay," and I'd have been, "Ha ha ha ha, brilliant!" You know, we're on, we're supporting iOS 13 minimum. I think 14 was the release at the time, uh, but I didn't do that because you know, again, it's just respect. It's you know, you know. We needed to get rid of 10 because it was causing us a problem. You know, if it comes to the point where 11 starts to causing us the same problems, I'll come back and we'll have the same conversation with you then. I think it's, it's so important to, to to trust the people who are best placed to make your to, to make the decision. You know, I, Absolutely. I would have been of telling a product organization, you know, um, why we work a particular feature or you're know, to challenge user insight that they've got from some user testing um, or, or something like that. Um, you know, so when you've got engineering decisions, you also have to drive those decisions into the people who have the right expertise and the right skills to actually yeah. make that right judgment call and, and, and to come back. And you have to trust what you're told and, and accept that you know that um, if if an engineer is making a recommendation, there's a reason for that recommendation being made. Um, 
um, and, and trust and trust that expertise. Now, I think this plays into for me, you know, the the, the advantages and the benefits of, of creating truly cross-functional collaborative teams that bring together your know, uh, different disciplines right across the business um, in order to drive the expertise. I mean, you know, I think that there's a lot of research out there now that, that demonstrates that um, your engineers like working for, for engineers and actually having your centralized engineering functions within organizations um, is your know, drives to a big benefit to organizations. Um, but we need to work collaboratively with all areas of the business. And that means, you know, maybe you have a UX chapter, maybe you've got a product management chapter, maybe you've got an iOS engineering chapter, maybe you've got a test chapter. Um, but actually bringing together those those expertise from a whole range of different disciplines, that's really where you, you can you know, really create um, truly high performing teams. Um, I don't know if that aligns to your experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's again, it's all going back down to that, that respect, respect what the people are doing. And uh, understand, you know, they, like I said, they are the experts in, in in that field, and you know, and let them let them be the experts, and they will excel in that, you know, and giving them the freedom, they'll in turn give you the freedom back, and that can only only do one thing, and that can only benefit everyone, you know, uh, and collaboration obviously is key, you know, without a doubt, making sure that you know you and transparency, you know, complete transparency in what you're doing, where you want to go with it, even if it might you might not agree across you know across chapters that. You know, this is where we're going. Just, just let people run with something and try. You know, let them, let them try and make a decision. You know, that they may turn around later and say, actually, you know, we, we, we did, we did the wrong thing there. But at least they will have confidence going forward, knowing that they, they tried it. So if they, they can, they'll never question themselves then. But you know, and the other teams will never question. So why didn't you do that? Why didn't you go down that route? Well, actually, we did. We tried it. It didn't work. You know, and maybe we'll try it again in six months' time. But for now, you know, that's the reason why 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 we went down this route because we tried it you know everyone i thought thought it was crazy we did it uh, and it didn't work oh you know it, it could turn and it could prove to be the right thing you know and there's definitely a balance in that space because you definitely don't want to be the organization or the person within the organization that's always saying no we've tried that before therefore we're not trying it again you know there's, yeah, no. there's definitely a, there's definitely a healthy balance in that space so you know uh, trying something out testing learning and not making the same mistakes again, but also not being open to the fact that just because something didn't work six months, a year ago, two years ago, doesn't mean that it wouldn't work again if we revisited yeah. that idea and revisited the decision. Um, and I, I guess that's it, it's so difficult, especially when you when, when you get organisations that have your know, fairly static teams, or you've got people that have been in organisations for a long time, have a lot of the history and a lot of the knowledge. Um, it, it can often be quite difficult to to balance that and to make sure that you you are still yeah. being a, a an organisation that is continually learning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, another one for me, and you know, on that similar track, and one thing that I put, always push to my teams is, and if something is working, if something's working really, really well, revisit it, because you might think it's working really well, you know, but who knows? It, it may turn turn around that actually there is a better way of doing it. Just because it's always the way we've done it and it, it works doesn't mean it's the best way. It could be that you know you spend two months looking into it, looking at different alternatives, and you know what? Yeah, we were right. It was the best way to do it. Again, gives you confidence for the next six to twelve months going forward. That saying, you know what? We are still doing the right thing. We are still heading in the right direction. Don't allow yourself to get stale. You know, with, with decisions you made two years ago, but it, you know they, they could still be the right decisions, and that's okay. Very, you know, I mean, and so as you know, software development's ever changing, so there's always a good chance that there is something new just around the corner. But you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, but don't be scared. Don't, you know, don't be scared to question. So I want to turn our attention, uh, you know, a little bit more to to what you actually do and what your job is. So I introduced you yeah. as a principal iOS engineer at Jaguar Land Rover, and one of the That's things right. that I'm noticing with different people that I talk on on the podcast and you know. Um, different conversations I have with the different companies, um, you know, have different meanings behind job titles and, and what what yeah. jobs actually are, what people actually do. So, so as principal engineer at Jaguar, what do you what do you do? So, uh, uh, so at Jaguar Land Rover, I'm responsible for the mobile app team based out of Manchester. So, I kind of help define and drive a technical roadmap for our mobile app space. So, you know, everything from defining technical strategies, ways of working, I'm responsible for mobile engineering leads, chapter leads, and I also have a technical specialist who reports into me as well. Obviously the role covers elements of line management as well for the chapter leads and, and for the engineering leads. Uh, and obviously I look after, uh, you know, 
I'm kind of there for all the, all the other mobile engineering devs as well, but they then report into the engineering leads and the chapter leads. Uh, but you know, we all work as one as one unit. So the role sounds as if it's kind of got a bit more of a management focus, but do you still like to get your sleeves rolled up and dig into the code? Yes, I mean, you know, the role is a lot more hands off uh, than previous roles I've had. Uh, the opportunity to get to, you know, to, to roll my sleeves up and, and dig in is is definitely there. Uh, since I've been there, I've been there seven months now. I haven't really done as much because there's kind of been a lot to do. You know, we're we're a relatively new team in Manchester. Uh, I mean, there's I think there's, we've got 17 devs at the moment uh, working on the mobile app space. And when I started, I think there was probably only about seven or eight of us. So we're actively hiring and building up the team. So there's a lot to do. There's a lot of things that we're in a transition period of doing when in taking over uh, an old app that was kind of looked after by a third party previously. We're building that up. Uh, we're getting that into a stable position, you know, again, defining ways of working. So there's been a lot of a lot of that going on since I've started. That slowly started to kind of, we are starting to, start to tie out the creases with a lot of that now. So, you know, I think I wrote a bit of code the other day for the first time in a while, which was quite exciting. So, yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, we'll be getting my hands dirty at some point in the future. But like I said, it's just been all systems go for start. And obviously that comes with, with a new job, which I, I've been absolutely loving, by the way. You know, it's been a brand new challenge for me to really, really, you know, like I said, help help steer the team in the right direction, you know, bring my experience to the table and be there and support them. You know, and we've got some fantastic engineers, uh, uh, you know, uh, working in the mobile space and to and really to be able to, you know, help them make, you know, support them in the decisions that they want to, uh, they, they want to make. Now, I guess if you're taking over an app that's probably been developed by a different team, that's always a challenge. Um, but if you're actually actively trying to bring an app in-house, that's previously been developed by a, a third party. Maybe there are extra challenges there. I mean, how, how have you found that experience? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm sure at some point in, our, in everyone, a lot of people's development careers, you've inherited a code base, and you know, this this was no different. You know, I think it was just a case of two ways to look at it. It's obviously, you know, we have we had features to develop, features to build. You know, we, obviously the customers have got expectations. There's 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 a product roadmap. You know that we, you know, we have to commit to. But at the same time, you know, there's there's the vision of the app. Where do we want to take it? What do we want to do with it? And that's kind of where the juggling act's been a little bit. It's finding that balance of, okay, what do we, what can we do, and what do we need to do to take this forward? And that's kind of what this last seven month for me has been about, and me and, and the rest of my my engineering team it's been about okay identifying what we want to do and you know we're space the last seven months with you know we've identified various different areas okay we're going to do this we're going to go in this direction we're going to do this going to do this direction and then a month and a half later we've turned and said no we can't do that we've dug a bit deeper we're going to have to go in another direction and we've dug a bit deeper then we're going to have to go in another direction and we've kind of just been it's been like that and it's only really this last month or so that we've actually turned around and said okay we know what we're doing now we know the direction we're going in with it you know, we've all got a good understanding of it and this is what we're going to do you know and, you know and then there's you know there's the getting the buy-in from the product as well which has been great because again you know going back to the part before about having the respect and and that's one of the one of the great things of working at jlr is is is, is everyone wants to build amazing products for our customers you know and and again you know we appreciate you know the, the product value behind new features in the app and obviously commitments that have been made for new vehicles etc uh, and likewise they understand what we've inherited and what we have and what we're building on top of and what we need to do to take this forward technically you know so there's been a real good understanding there and i said get buying from product there wasn't really any buying it was just more of a mutual agreement you know we knew, we know what we need to do to take this forward I think um, you know a big thing for me. I, I've worked in you know, organisations that have, have outsourced development, um, you know, to to third parties or to vendors, um, and I've also worked in organisations that have had full in-house your know, engineering teams. And I think it's it's important to recognise the motivations of the people who are you know, building out a particular code base and what's driving them at that particular point in time. And you know, sometimes you kind of you get into an organisation that for whatever reason has a particular business case you're trying to deliver to. Or maybe there's a deadline or an importance of getting something out of the door by a certain point in time. And, and that will drive certain behaviours with an engineering team. So it doesn't make a difference that's in-house or, or outsourced, by the way. I think that, that will drive certain behaviours with an engineering team. But, but I think, for me, there is always something about if you're working with a team that is, is internal within your organisation, 
to know that they're going to have to maintain the product for the long term. There will always be you know, um, more goodwill and more willingness to make sure that actually we're building out something which is a quality product. You know, there, there's a, a saying I was talking about with one of our guests a couple of weeks ago um, where he was talking about eating your own dog food. And you know, the idea that if, if I've actually you know, built this app out, I know I've got to maintain it for the long term, I'm going to have to continue to service this code base, then that's going to drive a totally different set of behaviours to maybe a third party yeah. organisation commissioned for a particular delivery to deliver a particular milestone or a particular increment and actually want that increment to be delivered, you know, they will never have to touch the code base again. Um, you know, I think it, it 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 really plays to um, you know, how, how you motivate your engineering teams and, and how you get them to make sure you're building the right quality for what you're trying to achieve at any particular time in an organization. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and kind of one of the ways where we kind of look at that is is you know, the way I always say it to my team is this is ours now to do what we want with. You know, we, we own this now, you know, regardless of the state it's in, you know, and it's I constantly asking the question, what do we want to do with it? You know, we, we're going to we're going to own this going forward. How do we see this working long term? What would make us what's going to keep what's going to get the best out of us as engineers? That's going to allow us to give the best product to our customer. And, you know, if that, you know, the answer is never ever going to be in my opinion it's never going to be we're going to have to sit there and suck it up and just deal with this core base we've got and and sit there and do it it's always going to be okay we're going to have to look to break this out yes it's going to be a long-term project but you know we're all in it for the long haul the way i see it you know we're not an agency you know it's not a client who may disappear tomorrow you know i'll make it outsourced to something else this is our product we own this you know let's think big let's think future you know we can set some short-term medium-term long-term goals that's great you know but but you know, I basically say to them, you know, where do you want to take this? And, you know, tell me where you want it to go and we will push for that and we will push in that direction. And that seems to, seems to you know, the, the, the team responds really well to that. You know, there's, there's, and, and that generates a lot of excitement because, you know, they've got the support and you know, when you get the support back from the products as well, they were like, yeah, you know, we want to get the best out of this you know we want you you know we want you to build the best software you can go ahead and do it you know you, you'll get automatic buy-in for that and you know so, some things take a little bit longer sometimes and yeah you are restricted you know with with deadlines etc uh, and, and like i said things that you've already potentially uh uh you know pr- promised to deliver and committed to but you know as long as you are progressively showing that things are changing things are happening decisions are being made and the right decisions are being made you know, I think that's 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 the best way to to motivate the team going forward and, and keep keep getting the best out of the engineers. And, and that's a really good example of a challenge that might be faced by the engineering team that the rest of the organisation might not appreciate. So when when you've been faced with a challenge like that, and you know, maybe you've got some people in the organisation that are trying to drive a decision that's that's you're know, going in a, a different direction to one that you would like to take, how do you how do you help leaders in different parts of the organisation to understand those challenges? And to understand the consequences of the decision that they're about to take. Yeah, again, I mean, this kind of falls back to the earlier part of our conversation, where it's about that, you know, it's about having that mutual respect, isn't it? Really, it's you know, you you, you can you can give them as much as you want on paper. You know, you can give them statistics. You can give them, you know. Uh, prototypes that show where you're going to go with this and, and what it's going to do and what its capabilities are if you give us the time to do this but i think you know it's it, i think it does come down to it just just comes down to that that whole respect again it's don't try and pull wool over their eyes be honest with them about it you know turn around and say you know and and, and just be again be, be transparent with everything you're doing as well don't try and do anything that you you know, don't say okay I'm, I'm we're gonna only gonna do the x y and z but then try and do a b and c at the same time just say actually you know what we said we're going to do x y and z but we're also going to do a b and c as well this is why this is this is how we're going this is how we're going to do it forward and you know you, you you'll get you'll probably potentially get pushback on that you know and and you just gotta i think you've just got to stop and just say to yourself okay you know what i don't like ever saying you have to admit defeat but maybe you have to stop and look and say, okay, do the, is this going to change our approach? Maybe we do want to go down a particular direction. We can't, but it doesn't necessarily mean we could not go down a different different route that kind of lends itself to, you know, where they want to go, what their ambitions are. You know, that could still 
still be an option for us. Let's go and explore that. And let's feed that back to them. If that doesn't work, we can say, look, we tried to adapt to this for you. You know, we tried to we, we tried to see where you were coming from. It's not worked. We we have to go down this route, you know. And again, you know, it's just it, it's just there's a little bit of give and take, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit of give and take on either side. And it's just a case of just just, you know, just I guess just I don't want to say baffling out because it's not a battle. You know, it's just it's just ironing out the creases on both sides, really. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. That mutual respect is, is really important. That you recognise that everybody does have a power of defense. Um, but you know, I think it's um, it's it, it's important to try and you know, walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. You know, in order to see that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, yeah. Um, so you like me, you know, proper Apple fanboy. Uh, you know, yeah. love, love a good Apple keynote. Love a good Apple event. Um, we are um, literally, you know, what, six weeks away from WWDC. I know. Um, How quick is that come City. around? I know. It's, it's unbelievable that we're, we're back at Dub Dub again uh, this year. Um, really interesting. What what do you think um, we're going to see from Apple this year? What's, uh, what's going to be the next latest and greatest thing? Oh, you know what? It, it's... I was going to say, it's, I, I, I want to sit on the fence and say it's going to be the quiet year and there's not going to be a lot, but that was last year, wasn't it? Uh, but I mean, I, I don't know. It's hard because I mean, I always keep going back to to WWDC nineteen when obviously when Swift UI and was released and everything like that. And that was literally, I know it was the it was the motto. It was mind blowing. Uh, what we're going to see, obviously, without a doubt, there's going to be some some definite enhancements in Swift UI, without a doubt. Uh, that's going to be the big one. What happens in there? I don't know. I mean. It's weird. You hear a lot of people. You, you see, you see a lot on social media. You see a lot of people's wish lists pop up around about this time, and they all start to they all start to come around. And and it's weird. You all, I mean, you always look and say, "Oh, we want to see this in Swift UI this time. We want to see this. And we want to see this." And people bang on the door and bang on the door for it. And then Apple turn around and do something completely different. And you're like, "Oh, right, okay. I see why you didn't do that in the first place. It's because you wanted to go down this route." I mean, what was an example of it? Uh, it was the oh. It was the project marzipan which were, was at the catalyst you know and 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 we we're banging on the door banging the door for that and it, it kind of catalyst came out and it, it was i don't know not it was kind of died to death i don't know many people who, who, who use that or you know but I, it was that just the building blocks for you know the cross-platform developments on using the m1 architecture was that literally just one of the first steps to test test the water with the developers to see if it was any interest there? I don't know. It seems an awful lot of work for them to do it. But uh, so again, it, it, it's hard to tell. You know, you, you can have a wish list. A lot of people people talking about Swift UI having. Uh, uh, I'm hearing a lot about like much uh, much more native uh, persistent store or core data store, core data integration with Swift UI. I mean. I think there will be something along them lines, but it won't be what we want and we won't be what we think it is, but we'll love it. I know that for a fact, you know. So uh, the thing that I struggle with for Apple events now is that, you know, but back in the day, when I, when I was in university, you know, I, I had a, I think my phone was an XDA orbit. It was just before, just before the Apple iPhone got announced. I, I remember kind of thinking to myself, oh man, I, I, I wish I could have email on my phone or I wish I could. Yeah. Uh, um, have Wi-Fi on my phone, or I wish you know, I had a list of my long of all these wishes of what I really wanted my, my phone to be able to do, or what I wanted my device to be able to do. And over the course of the last twenty years, we've obviously had iPhone, we've had iPads, and we've had um, you know pretty much everything that was on my wish list over the last twenty years has been ticked off. You know, and it's it's been incrementally ticked off as we kind of you know, got this new technology and new things to become available. And I kind of find myself now saying, you know, well. We're going to see some incremental improvements as developers at WWDC. We're absolutely going to see some new libraries, some improvements as you say, the stuff UI into other frameworks, and that's going to be really cool. But actually, you know, how do we now change the needle? How do we do something more than, than, than what we've got? What, what do people actually want in their lives? Yeah. And they have yeah. from a tech perspective. And, and I really think we're kind of, you know, we're approaching a, a point in, in the tech world generally where we need another, you know, we need another. Um, iPhone announcement moment. And when I say the iPhone announcement moment, I mean the moment that Steve Jobs in 2017, actually 2007, strode out onto the stage um, and said, "Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I've got a an internet communicator, a music listening device, and a phone. You're all yeah. in one device." Was yeah. a really powerful moment. 
And I know we had iPad, but I don't really think that that for me was another moment that really kind of got got to that same level. And but I kind of think we're 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 now on the cusp of something like that that we need in the tech world. Yeah, not quite sure what it is. I and mean, we hear talk of the Apple Car, but I mean that in reality is probably your know, another three, four, five years away. You know, before it actually gets to to something which which can actually be released. Um, but I'm I'm hungry for that moment. Um, but I just I just don't see where it's going to come from at the moment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's a case of I think the last few years, and myself especially, I think you hit the nail on the head again, those two, when you said about you know what what did you want? I mean, a lot of people say what do you think is going to come from WWDC, and immediately as a developer now, you know, as a more seasoned Apple developer, I start to think about what do I think Apple are going to do? When really I should be asking the question is what do I want Apple to do? And you know that's and, and, and you know that them are the answers that I want. I want Apple to like you said turn around and, and give me something that I you know that I want. Uh, and and that's the thing you know it's it's I can truthfully when when was the last time we actually really got that? You know uh, I mean you hear a lot of people talk about they want to they want to develop they wanted Xcode on iPad and that was doing the rounds for years, wasn't it? You know, everywhere. I want Xcode for iPad, Xcode for iPad. And they brought out the, the new playgrounds with this with UI support. And it was like, you know what, that's exactly what it should have been. You know, it ludicrous to think that anyone would want to develop, you know, you would probably do it for about 10 minutes and you think it would be cool to have Xcode on your iPad. Uh, and then if you turn around, you know, and, and or, you know, I've left my Mac at home, I've, you know, I've come into the office today and, uh, but it's okay, I've got my iPad, and oh, actually, we've got a critical production issue. We really need to delve in and debug. No one's going to want to sit and do that on their iPad, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's, but actually, what what they've done is they've turned around and they've given you, well, here's an opportunity to, to build apps. Yeah, they're not going to be industry groundbreaking apps, but you can build an app, you can build a little game, you can build, you know, a little hobby app or something like that on your iPad. Yeah, perfect. It's exactly what it is. And it's the building blocks, I guess, it's the start. If a lot of people start to to adopt it, they say, "Okay, maybe how can we how can we do the next step?" And yes, you'll get the usual people banging on the door. I want Xcode on my iPad. Give it to me, and they're like, "No, it's not going to work." But they'll find some so, way so to give us something balance. something different. There's, a, there's there's definitely a balance. I think that you know we 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 all talk about how we need to listen to our users and make sure we build stuff that our users want, and that is so critically important. Yeah. Um, but then but then you also hear you know um, think back to Henry Ford. Um, you're back in the um, your early 20th century, you're know, kind of talking about you know, his, his invention of the car. And there's a really famous quote where he came out and said, if, if I asked people what they wanted at the time, they would have said a faster horse. And I think there is yeah. no need of, as, as an organization like Apple, that is, you're trying to, to really build the future. You, know, you have to accept the fact that you're maybe actually they're, they're innovating at such a level that maybe we can't yet comprehend what it is they're trying yeah. to produce. Yeah. Oh, we've got to get that balance right. You know, it has to have a good customer base, has to have a user base. Um, it has to be something that we all want. It has to solve our problems. And I think it's it's that fastidious focus on problems that that we really need. And and, and right now, you know, from a tech perspective, you know, what what problems do I have? Um, and mm. you know, I probably the closest I've got to this in in recent years. Um, I, I travel up and down to London quite a lot, and when I'm on the train, the mobile signal is rubbish. Now that to me is a real world tech problem because you know, I want yeah. I want great mobile signal when I'm on the train. Now that's something that could and should be solved, but I haven't got that other you know that that next thing. You know what what is the thing that I need in my life from a tech perspective that I'm going to see yeah. and go oh my god I've I've been missing out so much for all of my life because I haven't had this. Um and and I, I really hope that that Apple come up with it. Maybe it won't be Apple. Maybe it'll be Tesla or one of the other you know amazing tech companies that are going around. But I, I really can't wait to see what it is. Um, because like you, um, I, I I just love tech, and I, I I like seeing cool tech that does cool things that you know um, you know really kind of changes how people operate and how people live. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and there's also also the element of it as well. It is, you know, you say about you know Apple maybe maybe should they should listen to the customers and say okay this is what they're asking for. Who's to say they haven't already tried that behind the scenes and turned around and said no nah, it doesn't work, which led to whatever it is they deliver. You know, and we we have to trust trust them to to a certain degree. So and say, yeah, they've probably they've probably already had Xcode running. It's probably built an IPA somewhere with Xcode that runs on the iPad, and it didn't work. So they looked at what they could do with it, and you know they decided to integrate it into Playgrounds. 
you know, and I'm, I'm sure there is. And it's the same, again, going back to what I was talking about before with that Project Marzipan or whatever it was called, and Catalyst as it ended up being, you know, they, they've obviously gone down a route where they've tried to, tried, to, tried to build that and build it in. But there's clearly always been a bigger picture in mind. You know, I mean, uh, but yeah, I think I think the big thing is for me is is I think mean, you know, every year, like I said, you get asked this question, what you know, what do you think is coming? And I always think I was trying to think, what, what do I think Apple's going to give? What do I think Apple's going to going to give? And really, I should be asking, like you said, what do I want? And and uh, so I'm just trying to have a think now, actually, what what would be on my top of my tech wish list from Apple? And I can't really think of anything at the moment. I mean, actually, I sat down and 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 uh, I got my setup the other day, and I've. And I finally updated, updated to Monterey and I was using, you know, where you can share the screen across and everything like that. And I had, uh, I've been using Sidecar on my iPad for a while and I absolutely love it. And I sat there with my setup and I sat down and, and my watch unlocked my Mac, which was great. And I've just been working upstairs on on, on my laptop and on the MacBook, sorry, laptop, I shouldn't say that, should I, as an Apple dev, on my MacBook upstairs. I came down and everything had synced across. And for the first time I sat there and I thought, Apple's ecosystem is working for me. And I felt really, really happy. And I didn't feel there was anything missing. You know, all my files were syncing perfectly. My watch unlocked my Mac. You know, I could use, you know, on, on before I updated to Monster, I could use Sidecar if I wanted, you know, to, for, for a second screen on, on my MacBook and stuff like that. And everything just, just felt right for the first time. And I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Uh, and like I said, but I want Apple to turn around and tell me, this is what you were missing. This, this was the groundbreaking feature that you wanted. Uh, and because I'm sure it it will be something that I wanted that I just probably just didn't know at the time. Well, can't wait to see what it is, and maybe in six weeks' time we'll watch the dub dub keynote and we'll go. That's what I wanted, and, and that'll be an amazing experience. I'm sure. Um, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. Uh, if people are listening and maybe you're inspired by what you've been talking about, I want to reach out to you. What's the best way to get in touch? Uh, best way to get in touch is via Twitter. So you can, my handle is uh, at Mr. Chris Parker, uh, and you can DMs are open, so you can just uh, just drop me a message or tweet or anything like that, and I'll get back to you absolutely. And if people want to read some of the books that you published and, and uh, got available, where where can they get those? Uh, so you can get those from my publisher, which is Pack Pub uh, Pack Publishing. I think it's packpub dot com. Uh, yeah, so there's uh, if you just jump onto there. Uh, and they can get hold of the books from there. And they're available on Amazon as well. Fabulous. Well, Chris, it's been really great talking to you. Thank you for taking the time out and chatting to me. Um, and uh, have a great uh, a great time with your new company. I hope that everything goes really well. Um, and Jack, you're Lander over. And, and can't wait to hear your feedback um, around WWDC time to find out uh, what you think of all of the Apple announcements. Um, thank you very much. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me in, Steve. I really appreciate it. Chris is a great engineering leader, and it was so insightful to learn about his experiences. On a personal level, the engineering leader has offered me a unique opportunity to speak with and learn from some amazing people, which at the start of this project I really didn't expect. It's amazing how different experiences can be so similar, and how ideas can be applied within different contexts. Next week on The Engineering Leader, we're going to be getting a little bit agile. Join me as I'll be chatting to Chris Roberts from Nimble Approach about what agility really means. In the meantime, remember, we all write bad code. If you disagree, you may as well switch off. My name is Steve Westgarth, and this is The Engineering Leader.